ラバラバグベルベルルピッピースコー・ギブソン・ショー !I am Scott Gibson. Who else would I fucking be? Welcome. Welcome along or welcome back. Whatever you are. Whether you're a returning customer or a first time listener. If you are a first time listener, where the fuck have you been, man? We're、uh, quickly approaching 100 episodes. Quickly approaching our 100th episode、um, of the Scott Gibson Show podcast. Started,、um, oddly enough, this is, this is how I like, I like、um, even numbers. I like nice,、uh, round, even numbers. Uh, I, I find them easier to remember、uh, age、uh, and dates and distance and time. I just find it easier, my small man's brain.、Um, so I know, for example, we did 20 episodes before lockdown. That's how I know where, where we are distance wise. So we're almost 80 episodes、uh, and we're still living in a COVID、uh, landscape. First 20 episodes started.、Um, oddly enough, this is, how, this is how long the pod's been gone for as well. This is my third house in this podcast. <laughs> started the first podcast in the, in the little flat in Edinburgh. Then we moved after God knows how many episodes to the,、uh, to the bigger flat in Edinburgh. And then、uh, we, we've moved again now to the, to the big house in the country. And、uh, here we are. If you can hear some scratching in the background, I do apologise. The tour manager is joining me in,、uh, in the studio stroke garage. And、uh, he seems to be finding great difficulty making himself comfortable. There he is. He's done the, the usual spin around in the spot ten times, scratch, 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 and finally settled down like an Arctic fox. Good times, right? We're fine. We're all, we're all plugged in. Good. <clears throat> so, yes, almost approaching 100 episodes. If, of course, if you are a, a rascal in the Patreon, then you've got nearly 200 episodes. What is there, 70 odd, 80 episodes on there, extra episodes,、uh, including comedy specials and all sorts. So if you're not on the Patreon, you really should be by this point. Patreon.com forward slash Big Scott Gibson. Go to the website, Big Scott Gibson.com. All the links are there. Four quid a month to sign up. Four quid! 50p a podcast. It's nothing. So you're supporting a struggling comic. And you're getting some wonderful, wonderful content in your ears twice a week. Right, I've got a list of things to talk about.、Um, we might as well, I was going to ease us in gently, you know? I was going to talk about my,、uh, my views on side salad. I was going to talk about the price of diesel. You know, but we might, we might as well just jump straight in to the hard stuff. And we're going to need to talk about. The so called parties. When is a party not a party? When does a gathering become a party? That's the question. That's the question on everybody's lips. Right now, the world is gripped on the difference between a gathering and a party. Also, there are large parts of the country that cannot understand that someone would bring wine and cheese to a party. That right away is blowing many fucking scumbags' minds. Because I imagine if a lot of you turned up to a party with a fucking wine and cheese board, you'd be fucking slashed. <laughs> What the fuck is that, Franco? It's an aged camembert, my man. Swipe, swipe. I also imagine if a lot of you were tasked. With bringing a, 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 a decadent cheese board with accompanying wine selection, I imagine many would probably have to change your identity and move country because you'd be fucked. There's probably a lot of you out there that think a cheese board or a, a cheese selection is that £5 one you get out of Asda every Christmas that's wrapped in fucking polythene. It's got a bit of Edam and it's got a bit of cheddar and it's got the,、uh, the Wensleydale with cranberries in it. What bell do you fucking want, my man? I, I would suggest that regardless of your,、um, the, the diversity of your cheese board <laughs> at Christmas, you know? 
I imagine many of you will be turning to a mother-in-law and saying, uh, Sandra, I can't help but notice only white British cheddar has appeared on the cheese board. Not much diversity there. So I would say, uh, regardless of how much you're spending on a cheese board at Christmas, whether it be £10 up to £100 plus, yes, £100 plus, every cheese board across the land can be uh, enhanced by the addition of uh, a a deadly triangle. (laughs) No No one would object to it. No one would have issues with Deadly Triangle. No one. Not a single person. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter the the crowds, the circles that you move in. Even if you're at the palace and you've got the, the finest selection of cheeses from across the empire, cave-aged bullshit. You're telling me that the Queen would turn her nose up at Dairy Lee Triangle? I think not. Well, what, what do we have? To, what does one have here on one's cheese board on this beautiful Christmas morning? I miss you, Philip. Stilton? Um, goat's cheese. You've got to have a ghost cheese. And then a fucking Dairy Lee Triangle right in the corner. Just to spice it up. What's the best cheese for cheese board? Here we go, right? Here we go. Let's have a look at this. Best cheese for cheese board. What do we got? Talk to me. Cheese board's delivered to you uh, from the, the cheesegeek.com. Not a paid ad. What are the best cheeses to include? Uh, okay, so we've got four categories. How to make the perfect cheese board? I mean, come on, just fucking give me this. Is sometimes the problem with Google, you know? Uh, there's too many, too many options out there, right? This is why I'll I'll go back and I'll say this over and over again. Communism has its place. Communism has its place, right? There are certain things that there just doesn't need to be this much choice over. You know? And I know that people will go, oh, it's a free market, Gibble. Well, that's how the economy works, man. You've got to have options. Nonsense. Butter, for example. Do we need fucking like 18 different butter companies? Just a fucking one. Butter. Standard British butter. From British cows. <laughs> None of your fucking French foreign bastard cows. Sometimes you, sometimes you go to the supermarket, right? And you're standing there. Like, yesterday, I had to go and get mayonnaise. I mean, there, do you know how many fucking different mayonnaises there are? Not, and it's not even, that's not even all of them. There's fucking hunters. Partly mayonnaise is a new thing. They're getting, because you get Japanese mayonnaise. Huh? And French and fucking whatever else. Even in a, a normal a Scottish supermarket, a small one as well, they had seven different mayonnaises. That's too, too much mayo. Too many options. And then, uh, now there's vegan mayonnaise. What is that? Just semen and fucking marshmallow fluff. Wicks together. A few cashew nuts. I've no idea. Anyway. Cheese boards. Um, what is this website? Lemon Tree Dwelling. Never fucking... How would you stumble across that? Okay. Uh, how to assemble the cheese board. How, why are we talking about cheese board, Gibble? We're, we're, we're talking about fucking Tony's having a party. I don't know. We've, listen, we've gone down this road. Let's let's see it out the other end. How to assemble a cheese board. Many of us have asked that question. Thanks to the good people at LemonTreeDwelling.com. We're going to figure that out. Here we go. Now, believe it or not, you might think that uh, assembling a cheese board is an easy thing. You get a board, you fuck a load of cheese on it, bash, bash, bosh, party time. Right? That this is why this is why none of us are Tories. Because we don't understand the process. 
Many of us watching the news coming in going, they're having a fucking wine and cheese party. What does that mean, Sandra? Well, Franco, what it is, is they've got a young boy with a bottle of fucking red wine up his arse and he walks around the room and then you drain him like one of the fucking Alsatian dogs that goes up the mountains. <laughs> and then on top of that, the poor bastard's got a fucking wooden board nailed to his back and on that is a selection of cheeses from across the empire. And what if you want a cracker? Or you don't want a cracker? That's a Tory wine and cheese party. You think they're all sitting about fucking taking the end off a bit of Stilton. Talking about how they're going to send back poor fuckers trying to get across the English Channel on a boat on a dinghy. That's what you think a Tory party is. But it's not. It's fucking red boys with bottles of wine up their ass. So how do we assemble the perfect cheese board? I mean, if we're not laughing, we're learning. Seven step process. Far too many steps for me. Step one. Start with the board. Classic, keep it simple, okay? Talk to talk to us like we're idiots. <laughs> How do you assemble a cheese board? I'd, I'd probably say we start with the board. Strong foundations, okay? Remember, these are not my words. These are the people at Lemon Tree Dwelling, whatever the fuck this is. Uh, cheese boards are typically assembled on a slate or wooden tray, are they? Which may be square, rectangular, or round. We're just naming shapes now. But if you don't already own one, I'm sure everybody listening to this owns a cheese board. <laughs> you don't just fuck on a chopping board. No, you can't, Franco. Right? It's Christmas, you cunt. Okay? And we're fancy in this house. Yes, there's a magnet rigged up to an electricity box so it goes slower, so we pay less. And yes, we've got a dodgy power card set up. But in this house, we do not serve our cheese boards on the bastard and chopping board that we use the rest of the year round. Go into the cupboard under the stairs and retrieve my slate cheese board. If you don't already own one, don't feel like you need to go out and buy one. You can use a plate, you fucking scumbag, <laughs> a cutting board, or even a baking sheet. What the fuck are you talking about, LemonTreeDwelling.com? A fucking baking sheet. In the name of Christ. Can you imagine the horror in your guest faces if you produced a cheese board with the finest selection of cheeses from across the empire on a fucking baking sheet, you scumbag, you heathen? They then go on to say any flat surface will work. I mean, shut your faces. Any flat surface, a any flat surface at all. A side table, a garden slab, your partner's arse, any flat surface will work for a cheese board, according to these fucking maniacs. So you've got your board, uh, or flat surface, uh, five, uh, six more stages to go. Uh, number two, select the cheeses. Try to include a variety of flavours and textures by selecting cheeses from different families. <laughs> the cheese families. Uh, add some charcuterie, a.k.a. cured meats, to your cheese board. Prosciutto, salami, soparasa, chorizo, mortadella. All good options. Uh, all Italian as well. Add some savoury. Think olives, pickles, roasted peppers, artichokes, uh, tapenades, uh, 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 almonds, cashews, or spicy mustards. Add something sweet. Think seasonal and dried fruits, candied nuts, preserves, honey, chutney, or even chocolate. Fuck off, you dirty bastard. Offer a variety of bread. Step six, sliced bag wet. Bread sticks, variety of crackers, different shapes and sizes and flavours. And finally, f uh, seven off. Uh, seven off. Finish off. Stage seven. With some garnishes. It's a great way to give your cheese board a seasonal touch. Use edible flowers, fresh herbs or additional fruits to give your board the look and feel you want. Uh, what are the families of cheeses? Right, here we go. There are four families of cheese. How can we be talking about cheese board for 15 minutes, Gibble? I don't know, but we're seeing this through. Four families of cheese, cheese even, for you to pick the perfect cheese board. And you need to hang one for each, or two, if you're a Tory. And the four uh, families are aged, soft, firm, and blue. <laughs> 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 uh, 
<laughs> a cheese board for all the Rangers fans out there. Age, soft, firm, and blue. I'm sure. I'm sure that is the start of a Rangers song as well. Uh, aged uh, includes things like uh, an aged cheddar, a Gruyere, or a Gouda. Oh, Gouda. Me and the missus went into a Gouda shop once when we were uh, in Amsterdam. Lured in uh, by the beautiful display they had in the window. Uh, I actually went in to get a sandwich and then they had all these different Goudas inside. Which to, uh, to the untrained eye is, uh, is Edam, my man. And uh, we must have eaten our weight in free samples. It was fucking amazing. So much to the point... Uh, when we actually came out, I, I couldn't even eat my sandwich. That's how much free cheese I'd eaten. Anyway, so there's your aged, your soft uh, brie camembert, soft goat. That's goat's cheese, not a soft goat. Uh, of course, you could slide your uh, your uh, um, fucking triangles in there as well. Firm, uh, your manchego, your parmigiano reggiano, your idam, and then finally your blue, your gorgonzola, your rock for your stilton, that kind of fuck, the smelly stuff. So as long as you get one for each of the families, uh, you know, think of it like uh, you're putting together the ultimate mafia uh, hit squad. You want one for each of the families, you know? Tips for making the ultimate cheese board. How, how, is, this a, how is this a website, you know? Excuse me. Oh, God almighty. So you've got your ultimate cheese board and you're off to the, uh, the Tory convention. Now... The headline from this article is, did the government have up to seven Christmas parties while well, urging people to follow the rules? And we have, we've got a long answer and we've got a short answer. I'm going to give you both. First of all, the short answer. Did the government have up to six, sorry, seven Christmas parties while urging people to follow the rules? Yes. Side question to that, does it make any difference to us? Absolutely not. I suppose the one thing that I've got to say I mean, I'm going to say a lot because this is my podcast. The one thing I've got to say about all this, right? Everything that is the the column inches, hello, as they have said, that have been taken up in recent days about this so-called fucking scandal. I mean, to even call this a scandal is a kick in the balls to actual scandals. That Boris Johnson... Members of the Tory party, fucking lizards, the elite, the 1%, the bastard English, were having Christmas parties at number 10 and other locations, so it seems. Last Christmas, when everybody was urged to follow strict lockdown rules, one is not surprising, and two, and I, I mean this honestly, and I'm not just saying this because it's a comedy podcast and, you know, we joke about things. I mean this generally. I couldn't give a fuck. I couldn't give a flying fuck. I do not care. I, I don't care about it. It has no impact on me. I'm not interested. And if you are one of these people, and I've seen a lot, I've seen a lot over the last couple of days, who are posting things about the Tories having these parties, fucking grow up. Grow up, man. I find it astonishing that this is what people choose to get angry about. I find it astonishing that even after everything we've gone through, with Brexit, and now with COVID, and that the amount of time that people have spent watching the news, listening to the news, questioning the news, still don't understand how they are being manipulated. Because if you don't think you're being manipulated by these stories, you are. Of everything that this government has done, of everything that Boris Johnson has done, of everything that the Tories have done and are currently still doing, them having Christmas parties is what you choose 
to get angry about. It is fucking astonishing. And I know a lot of you will be sitting going, but Gibbo, listen, I couldn't fucking bury my papa because the Tories are having a party and they say I can't stay in. Fucking grow up. Grow up. There's fucking women and children, and men, but nobody cares about men, women and children dying in a fucking ocean. And this government is arguing about who should recover the dead bodies. We have got scandal on top of scandal for the Tories. We've even got a thing that came out today about fucking Boris Johnson's renovations. Millions that have been taken, uh, taxpayers' money, millions that have been taken fraudulently from donations to fucking do up his house. But you're getting angry because a couple of fuckers are having a party. What 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 do what, 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 what do people want to happen here? And this whole thing about it's one rule for us and one rule for them. Yes, it is. And you know what? That's fucking life. If the government turn around and they say is anybody who has been found to have breached lockdown rules since they first came in to this date will face a 12-month prison sentence. And we sit and we watch a load of politicians being led away and we clap and we cheer and they go, oh, thank God for that, those dirty Tory bastards having a party, they should be in the jail. How many of us, listening now, could say we wouldn't be following them? I find it interesting that everybody's on the high horse with this, as if the whole fucking country followed every single rule, did nothing wrong. In the name of God, I, I posted a video up last year. Fucking uh, the junkies in the corner for me, the whole fucking floor of the close was lit up, they were having a house party. I couldn't believe it. There was people found uh, in, a, in a pub in Leith. The police put the fucking door in, there was 30 cunts having a lock-in in a pub. Of all the things that you can be angry about, of all the things you can be angry about, this is what you choose to be angry about. Just think about it for a minute, right? Just just, t- just take a step back for it and just think about this for a minute. I understand that we've got to have some way to place your anger and I get it, the Tories are an easy target, but here's the fucking problem I have with it. Every time there's an election, you vote the bastards back in. And we're done with this argument going, no one's Gibble, no one's Scotland. No one's Scotland, Gibble, we don't, we don't do that. Well, do you know what? We fucking do. Sadly, we fucking do. Because there's more bastard Tories than ever in the fucking Scottish Parliament. So some of these are. Seven parties they've had. I imagine there's a fucking lot more. People can't afford to heat their house. People are shitting themselves to turn their fucking heating on because they think they're going to get a bill for 40 grand in January. People are panicking now whether they're going to have a Christmas. People are panicking whether they're going to be able to get to work. People are panicking because they thought that they're now being asked to work from home again. And they're panicking that maybe their employer has went, you know what, I've had enough of this fucking bullshit. I'm going to pull my money out and fucking scrap the business. And then you've lost your job at Christmas and you can't afford to fill your heating and you can't afford to put fucking petrol in your motor because it's almost £64,000 a litre and you're fucked in the house. But let's not get angry about that. Let's not have meaningful discussion, news items about that. Let's get angry about fucking mad Tories having a party. They're laughing at us, Gibble. They're laughing at us. They're laughing at us being in the house and having a party. They're laughing at us. Grow up, man. I just find it all... Honestly, I find it... Astonishing is the only word. How many of you... did something you shouldn't do during COVID? How many of you had people ruin the house? When you shouldn't have. How many of you went to somebody's house when you shouldn't have? I know, I know, literally, I know 
10 people that I could name the now who posted happily in their social media that they had a house party, that they had family over. Honestly, they were just in the garden. No, we just had them in the garden. They weren't in the house. They weren't in the house. No. Yes, they had to go in for a shite, but that's just because it was a shite and they had a mask on and they didn't speak to anybody and then we fumigated the house after it, you know. No, yes, no, it was just in the garden and we drank two bottles of gin, you know, and we talked about the bastard men that had left us with six wins between us, but then she stayed over, but, but just because she'd had a bottle of gin, right, but she didn't stay in the house. You know, she slept in the living room, but that's not technically in the house because it's not a bedroom. And we left the back door open so we could blow all the COVID away, you know, so they just died over. I hate the Tories as much as the next person. But this, the, the amount of coverage this is getting, it blows my mind. And I think if we're, if we... If I want to look at this objectively, I think everything that Boris Johnson has done up until now during his time as Prime Minister, if you think that having a party at Christmas or being associated with it or being involved with it is going to be the thing that removes him from 10 Downing Street, you are, you're a fool. This is the kind of stuff that we should just not be engaging with. This is the kind of stuff we should be ignoring. If a news article comes out that Boris Johnson or members of the party have had uh, Christmas parties at number 10 during strict COVID restrictions, we should our response should be, fucking Tories. That should be our response and we move on. Because if you know anything about how politics works and especially how the fucking media works in this country, Something is going on behind the scenes. Anything that is brought out, any dirty washing that is aired in public, is done for a reason. You are being distracted by news of Christmas parties at Downing Street when you were locked in the house. Endless poor fuckers. The BBC have got a fucking line of the cunts round the corner at BBC's building. Poor bastards coming on going, I had to bury my husband in planning a funeral by ourselves because we were only allowed three and a half people into the funeral home and it wasn't it. I couldn't even see him. The BBC have got thousands of these bastards that they can bring out. Sob story after sob story. And listen, it is horrendous what people have gone through during COVID. Horrendous. But this is a... This is distracting you for something. It's distracting you for something. I don't know what the fuck they're up to behind the scenes, but I'm telling you, it's something big. It's something big. I can't imagine anything worse than a Tory Christmas party as well. Could you imagine, man? Could you imagine having to sit there and have small talk with a bunch of fucking Tories? And listen, some of these have probably got Tories uh, for pals. You might even be a Tory. Fair fucks you. Who cares at this point? And I'm not talking about going to a party and like one or two years are Tories or you've got conservative mindset. I'm talking about being in the fucking Tory HQ We a bunch of Tories. Full on Tory boy. Intense. I can't imagine anything worse. Uh, article here, the government could have held as many as seven Christmas parties as millions followed strict COVID rules. And millions did not! Tories had met last night an event organised by Sean Bailey's mayoral campaign was held in the party's Westminster headquarters on December 14th while London was in tier two restrictions. Around 25 people danced and wore festive hats. The bastards! as they gathered in the basement of Matthew Parker Street, the Times reports. Good on the Times. Eh? A good working class paper. A door is said to have been damaged at the raucous bash as two rent boys were nailed to it like Jesus on the cross as Tories shot loads of semen from across the room in the name of God, what's happening? Hours after Matt Hancock announced the capital would be moving into Tier 3. Hours after. So was it before or after Tier 3? The Times. 
Huh? Did this fucking Jesus Spunk Fest happen before or after? A spokesman confirmed. Who is a spokesman? The unauthorised, unauthorised social gathering. When is a social gathering a party? We don't know. Had taken place, adding the formal disciplinary action was taken against the four CCHQ staff who were seconded to the Bailey campaign. The confession comes amid claims a number of other gatherings took place in Downing Street. December 18th, here we go. Boris Johnson was forced yesterday to order Cabinet Secretary Simon Case to investigate allegations. A secret party was held on December 18th. It came after leaked footage showed his then press secretary Allegra Stratton joke about a fictional bash leading her, her to tearfully resign. The Prime Minister said he was furious, furious, at the footage, but still denied a party ever happened. Bloody didn't happen. <coughs> November 13th, a party. November 13th, a second party. November 27th, up to 50 people this time, said to have crammed cheek by jowl into Downing Street for another party. Um, December 10th, and then a Christmas quiz. Lastly, a Christmas quiz. Oh, poor... They can't even have a fucking Christmas quiz, the poor bastards. A uh, Christmas quiz was held in the Cabinet Office for number 10 staff at an unknown date in December, according to reports. BBC claims some workers joined via Zoom, but others arrived wearing Christmas jumpers, unaware how ridiculous it was. Oh, God almighty. The comments on these things are the fucking... The comments are usually better than the actual um, stories themselves. I don't know. I, I just think of everything that we can be getting angry about. You know, especially this time of year. We go back to Christmas last year. And we look at the Tories having these Christmas parties when apparently we're all in lockdown on Tier 2 or Tier 3, whatever those restrictions were. I can't, it's that long ago, I can't even remember. I just think about the timing of these things, you know? And I know I go on about this stuff all the time, but I just think, think about the timings. Somebody's had this information for, for months. Somebody's known about this for months. This all happened last Christmas, but they wait and they bring it out this Christmas. You know? For what reason? I mean, even again today, uh, you know, uh, as, the, as the headline says, another blow for the Tories. He's fined 20 grand over these refurbishments to the number 11. That, now, this has gone on, this has gone through um, Parliament before. Uh, an independent uh, review panel was looking at this because of money that had been given to Boris Johnson or that Boris Johnson had taken for the Tory party to do refurbishments to the House. Conservatives have been fined almost £20,000 for failing to accurately report donations that help pay for the costly revamp of number 11. Probe found serious failings in the party's compliance system. Electoral Commission found the Conservative Party failed to fully report a donation of 67800 the majority of which was connected to the refurbishment of the 11 Downing Street flat where Boris Johnson lives with his wife Carrie. What I mean, what is a twenty grand fine to Boris Johnson or the Tory party? Absolutely fucking nothing. We 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 should probably be getting more angry about this stuff. I think than they're having a Christmas party. Really, I do. Almost seventy grand in donations being used to renovate a flat. How many more thousands? Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of pounds in donations. Do, I mean, who's donated to the Tory party for a start? I've been used for personal gain. I, find, I do find it interesting when all this stuff comes up about Tories having Christmas parties, MPs doing this. We all seem to have forgotten about the expenses scandal. We all seem to have forgotten about that. Now as if all MPs, or MPs that aren't Tories, are now fucking gods. And they're doing nothing wrong. I'm not saying this for a second that the Tories are 
you know, good. I mean, I'm sure there's some good people, but they're, they're fucking Tories, right? So the fact that a Tory makes you no right in the heat anyway. But this, at this moment in time, our focus should not be on the bloody Christmas parties. Our focus should be on the fact that it looks as though we're heading towards some kind of further restrictions. It looks as though we Omicron, we're heading towards further restrictions. That's what it looks like. So now you're going to be stuck in the house again at Christmas. Potentially alone. Only this time, you're going to be fucking freezing. Because you can't afford to put your heating on. You can't afford to turn your oven on. You can't afford to buy a turkey. You're fucked. You're going to have to be sitting in your back garden with a man-made trap hoping that you can snare a fat pigeon. <laughs> it's turkey taste of a funny mum. It's because it's pigeon, you wee dick. And not just any pigeon, a right shitey fucking Glasgow pigeon. <laughs> oh, fair play to the Tories, but man, they they move fast, you know. They're getting shit for the fucking uh, disco cheese party. They're getting shit for fucking stealing money to refurbish a house. But God, do they know how to spin a story? Because that fucking lizard queen herself has bashed out another way. In. If, if if ever questions need to be asked over anyone, it is fucking his wife. What? I don't even know. What is her name? Is it, is it it's no Simon. What is <laughs> Carrie. Carrie Simon. That's her name. God almighty. She's had another win. Prime Minister Boris Johnson and his wife Carrie uh, have announced the birth of a healthy baby girl at a London hospital. Private hospital, I imagine. Previous post on Instagram announcing the pregnancy, Mrs Johnson, 33, oh, said she'd had a miscarriage at the start of the year. Oh, for fuck's sake, Kimbo, that is terrible. Incredibly blessed with pregnant again, but also felt like a bag of nerves. I can only imagine. I can't imagine what that must be going through. That must be the one of the worst things you could ever experience in, in, in life with a miscarriage. And then I fully do imagine that if you were to be lucky enough to get pregnant after that, it, it must be nine months of just worry. It must be. A couple welcomed their first child, Wilfred, Jesus Christ, April last year. He uh, was born a month after Prime Minister was treated in hospital for COVID. Mr. John shared details of blah, 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 blah. He's 57. And she is 33. Absolute question marks. What the fuck is going on, man? But there you go. They can spin a story, man. You know? We need something. They're probably the press office going like, we need something to deflect for this fucking cheese and wine, bunga bunga, fuck fest. Give me something. Let's just cut her open and get that way out early. Brilliant, right. Let's get it in. Get in the papers. Carly, she's having another baby. No, I'm not due for another month. Shut it, hen. The fucking shit's kicked off for the cheese and wine parties. We're cutting that way now. If you are generally uh, angered by all of this, then I would hope uh, to see your uh, Instagrams, Facebooks, Twitters full of uh, positive campaigning for uh, an alternative party once the, uh, once the election comes round. Uh, and then we can move the Tories for good. Will that happen? Probably not, because we're relying on the English, and they can't be trusted for fuck all those people, because I imagine, like anything else, once the time comes for another election, the uh, the Daily Mails will start running stories about people with a different skin tone coming over here committing crimes and stealing your jobs, and then the English will vote the Tories back in, and the cycle of hell will continue on until our life is over. God help us all. Merry Christmas, everybody. <laughs> Right, I've been thinking a lot, I say a lot, I thought about it for about a minute, about the climate, the planet, uh, Earth, and especially COP26, because now it's over, um, it's all gone very quiet again on the on the Western front of, you know, how we're going to save the planet and all that, you know what I mean? And I think I have found a solution to all of the Earth's problems, right? Now, 
from what we understand from our in-depth knowledge of uh, COP26 and the planet and the global uh, crisis, we need to, it, it boils down to, literally, uh, pardon the pun, it boils down to stopping the increase in yearly global temperature rises. And I think 2% is uh, what we're trying to get to, uh, meaning that we are we are stopping the rise in temperature every year by 2%. Okay? That's what, that's what we're going for. That's what we're aiming for. That's what we're trying to get to. And the ways in which apparently we do that is uh, giving you more bins uh, to recycle, even though, from what we can gather in the news today, the council just fucks it on one big bin and then sends it to Romania to go into a landfill. So, you know, <laughs> I mean, the solution is as long as the problem isn't in your back garden, who gives a fuck? Am I right? Am I right? We're not going to go to Romania on holiday, are we? No. So we might as well just fucking send all our shit over there. Why not? So, as with everything, the solutions and the way to fix the problem lies with you, the average person, the working man and woman, it is your fault it's happening and it's your problem to fix. Not big business, not government, uh, not lizard people, not global billionaires, not the 1%, you know, they're not going to fix it, you are. And I, Gibbo, your trusted podcast and confidant, have found a way to do it. Now, it's an, it's an extreme measure, but it's a measure that we can all take starting right now. And it costs us nothing. It will cost you nothing. If anything, it's going to save you money. All right? And you may be thinking to yourself, Gibble, a plan that costs nothing to set up and will save us money in the long term. Also saving the planet. Good God. Can such a plan exist? Yes, it can. Now, it's an, it's, an, it's an extreme idea, and I think that we've been looking in the wrong place, and the, the, the solution, the answer, like most things in life, has been under our nose the whole time. It's been staring us in the face, and we just couldn't see it. <clears throat> a lot of the stuff that came out of COP26, and a lot of the stuff that's been spoken about in recent years is pushing the idea of alternatives in a lot of aspects of our life, whether it be alternative fuels, for example, electric, whether it be alternatives, solutions to power, moving away from coal and fossil fuels, and moving into wind and wave and children's screams and harnessing the power of the orgasm, that kind of thing, alternative ideas. Food is also a huge thing that's being looked at and actually is where my solution lies. Now, we are told on a daily basis in the media, in things like podcasts and in advertisement that we have to move away from eating meat and move towards a more sustainable and plant-based diet. This is the thinking and the path that many of us are asked to go down. Many of us now are conscious of the amount of meat we consume, and if you're not, you're probably at least conscious of where your meat comes from, how it's produced, how it's reared, the life in which it had, and you're probably more knowledgeable now about the process involved in the production of meat and the slaughter of meat as well. Many people are being asked to move to plant-based alternatives, whether it be seitan, whether it be a uh, soya-based, uh, whether it be things like corn. We're seeing a lot of new companies springing up. We're seeing a huge push on uh, a, a move away from dairy and into dairy alternatives. So we have been looking at soya milk, almond milk, various different types of milk, um, non-dairy butter, non-dairy cheeses, moving away from that side of agriculture. And as I said, my solution 
lies in food. I think it's the easiest thing to do. And I've spoken a lot before about, on various different episodes of the podcast, about a lot of different problems that are going on in the world and how I think people miss the mark because you have to target the average person and you have to try and go after something and speak to them in a way that they understand. And I think I've got it. I think I've got it. Everybody eats food. Everybody eats food, right? Apart from the Afghans. But everybody eats food. Every single day, we will have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Most of us. Every single day. You'll at least eat one meal a day. Not many people will understand the fossil fuels or alternative solutions. Many people simply cannot afford a Tesla. Or they're concerned that they can't even turn their fucking heat on the new. How are they going to plug two motors in as well? So we go down the root of food. And we find one idea, one concept, that if we change all of us, every single person on the planet does this, every government brings it into law, makes it a legal requirement. If every country on the planet does it, overnight we will solve global warming. And the solution is this. Ban side salads. Simple as that. A global ban on side salads will overnight solve the climate crisis. Let that sink in for a minute. Now you're thinking to yourself, Gabo, that's a stupid idea. Is it? Is that a stupid idea? Think how many side salads are produced on this earth every single day. How many? A billion? Easily. Easily one billion side salads are produced every single day on this planet. That's 7 billion a week. 30 billion a month. 300. <laughs> you can see where I'm going with this. 65 billion a year. And how many of those side salads end up in the bin? Every fucking one of them. Every one of them. Nobody eats a side salad. Nobody. And even if you're one of these people who goes, I do care, but I eat my side salad. No, you don't. You're lying. You're a liar. No one eats it. It's offered up as, a, as an afterthought. It's not even a real salad. <clears throat> Taking some shitey old lettuce and a slice of red onion and a bit of tomato on the fucking side of your plate is not a salad. That is a dining experience for a guinea pig. Yes, I'll give you that. If you were to ban side salads, the impact that that would have alone on the earth would reduce global warming overnight. I went to a cafe last week. I had a bowl of soup, because it was called a bowl of soup and a toasty, Right? The option was you can get half a toasty. I went, who the fuck is having half a toasty? A toasty's a toasty. You don't have half a toasty. Who's ever went in a cafe and went, can I just have half a toasty? Nobody has. Not even children have half a toasty. A fucking toasty's a toasty. I says, I love a soup and I love a toasty. And my soup and my toasty turned up. And it had a handful of crisps, and I thought, extravagant. And then it had a side salad. Who the fuck is having a side salad with soup and a toasty? Not this man. Not needed, not required. And a lot of places will fuck it on the plate because they think it makes it look good. That's it, it's not there for any reason. Think how many millions would be saved from the economy if we banned side salads. I've got, listen, and I've thought about this, right? I'm going to throw some numbers at you here. I'm going to throw some numbers at you. 
in a percentage. What percent do you think of bag salad? So the bags of salad that you buy in the supermarket, what percent of them do you think is thrown away every year in the UK? All right, think about it. I'll give you, I'll give you a minute to shout out some answers, right? You're in the supermarket. We've all done it. I know I've done it. You're in the supermarket. You buy bags of salad because in your head, you think, I'm a fat bastard, man. I've got to eat more fucking salads. So you buy a bag of salad. You buy mixed leaves. You buy fucking spinach. You buy all this shite. You bring it home. You put it in the fridge and you forget about it. You forget about it. Don't say you do. Don't say you don't, sorry, because you fucking do. You forget about it. Until you open the fridge up because you're doing the kind of, the, the bastard council dinner, right? Two weeks down the line, at the end of the week, when you've not got any fucking money, and you can't afford to go and get a big shop, so you're having a council tea, where you're opening the fridge and the freezer, and whatever is in there is getting cooked, and it's all getting fucked on a plate, and you look to the back of the fridge and you think, there's a fucking pillow in there, and it's a bag of salad that has oxygenated, and it's inflated up in your fridge, and at the bottom of that, the wee salad's pished itself, it's all fucking salad soup at the bottom, watery, stinking salad soup and wilted leaves. And what do you do with that? You fuck it in the bin. You fuck it in the bin. So you have effectively went to the supermarket, right, in your car, because nobody's walking, okay? You're going in your car. You're burning fossil fuel. You're fucking cooking the planet to get to the supermarket to buy pre-packaged pre-packaged salad. You're then driving home, sticking that in your fridge, which is burning electricity and it's full of gas, to then stick it in the bin two weeks later. So, answer my question. What percentage of bagged salad is thrown away every year in the UK? The answer is 40%. Let me just say that again. 40% of bag salad bought in the UK is thrown away every year. 40%. Now that number, you may be sitting going, Gibble, you've pulled it out your ass. That is from the Guardian newspaper, you fucking bastards. So if anybody knows anything about salad, it's the fucking hipster cunts of the Guardian. 40%. 40%, that's almost half. That's almost half. Almost half of all bag salad bought in the UK is fucked straight in the bin. Nearly 40,000 tonnes, almost 180 million bags. 180 million bags of salad goes uneaten every year in the UK. Shocking. Shocking numbers. This is how we fix global warming. We don't eat corn. We don't stop eating chicken. We don't drink soya milk. You ban side salads. You ban side salads being sold anywhere on the planet. Ban it. Cafes. Would you like a side salad? Banned. Restaurants. A side salad with your steaks. Banned. And the kebab shop, would you like a side salad with your uh, kebab there, Mr. Kebab? Banned. If you serve a side salad, 40 years in the jail. 4 0. 40 years in prison if you serve side salad. Overnight, global warming would be reduced and fixed. And then, five years down the line, Once everybody's on board with it, once they've seen the changes, you know, spring returns, the seasons, the seasons return. Hockey. We're barbecuing in July. We're putting our winter coats on in November. The seasons have returned. All because we banned the side salad. And once we've got people on board, then we move it a step further. And the next step is to turn this argument over the food consumption on its head. Because we don't ask people to move away from meat to meat alternatives. We ban 
production of all vegetables. That's right. You heard me. First we ban the side salad, then we ban all vegetables. If you think about it, think about every veg that exists. Tomatoes, carrots, cauliflower, kale, spring onions. <laughs> uh, <laughs> butternut squash, marrows, peas, um... What other veg is that? Broccoli, broccolini, broccolini. Every fucking vegetable on the planet, mass production is banned, illegal. If you are a potato farmer, no potatoes, right? Because you make chips for them. So we're allowed spuds. Everything else, illegal. If you're a farmer, you're like, I've got fucking 42 acres of marrows in the jail. Gone. You can't buy vegetables in supermarkets anymore. It's illegal. You've got to grow them at home. If you want them, grow your own. That's allowed. Individual people growing their own little fucking plots of vegetables. Fine. Everything else, banned. But you can produce cows, pigs, sheep, and chickens. And you can eat as much of that as you like. And I'm telling you right now, You'd have more luck banning the production of veg than you would having people moving away to meat alternatives. Now, you may be thinking, well, this is nonsense. It's nonsense. And yes, banning vegetables probably is nonsense, and I've taken it a bit too far. But is the idea, the concept, the dream of banning side salads, is that extreme? Or is that actually a really good idea? Because I think it's a fucking great idea. That's what I think. <laughs> so next time you're in the supermarket and your other half, your wife, your girlfriend, your partner, whatever, goes to reach for a bag of side salad, you say, ah, 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 ah. no, 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 no. We're saving the planet. And she'll say to you, but you've got to eat more fruit and veg. You said, no, not the salad. I will eat potatoes and what's a fucking good veg? Carrot. I'll keep a carrot. No more side salad. Don't do it. Do not do it. And I know you have, I know we've all done it. We've all bought a bag of veg or a bag of salad, bought it home, stuck it in that fridge. And then watch it fucking expand. And then fuck it in the bin. Don't do it anymore. Don't buy salad. Don't buy veg. Ban side salads. And watch the planet recover. There you go. What an episode, man. <laughs> what an I think if I run for office, that would be my two things. I'll ban uh, the Tories. They just don't exist anymore. I'll ban all reference to them. Uh, you can no longer be a Conservative. And you can no longer buy, sell, or participate in the uh, the consumption of side salads. And overnight, the planet, the country, would, would prosper. Everybody gets a penguin, uh, an actual penguin, not a biscuit. Uh, free gas and electricity and uh, no more side salads there you go right odd episode um, late but you know this is this is life uh, still recovering from the cold stroke flu but these are this is, this is the life this is the life we're living it's the Omicron world we're waiting to find out has Omicron killed Christmas uh, let's see right in the meantime, stay safe, get on the website, subscribe to the mailing list, uh, buy tickets to the tour. Starting off in January, 30th of December, I'm going to be in Glasgow doing one last gig of the year. One last laugh before the bells. Uh, get your tickets from my website or from C Tickets. Search Scott Gibson, you'll find it there. 30th of December in Glasgow, that odd week between Christmas and New Year where nobody knows what's going on. Come and have one last laugh with me. Uh, it's not a tour show. Uh, some old bits, some new bits, and uh, just uh, just a wee giggle 
to see out the year. So please do come and join me for that if you can. 30th of December in Glasgow at the Classic Grand. It's going to be a belter. Um, right, that's it. Share the podcast, become a Patreon, extra goodies if you're on the Patreon, one extra podcast a week, loads of other stuff on there, and it will be growing and growing and growing as we enter the new year. So uh, that's it. Nothing else to say. I can't, I can't really think. I've probably forgot something. Uh, thank you to everybody who's in the Patreon. These are all beautiful people who will have a happy uh, and long, healthy life. Um, and that's it. Right, stay safe, look after yourself, wash your hands and your arsehole, and I will speak to you all very soon. Onwards. Thank you.